Hi guys. All right. Thank you for sticking with me. We're in the part two of chapter 25, Inside the Mind of a Planet Eater, where we're really going to squish it all down to my mashup of my about 10 or 12 days I spent with my favorite planet eater I've ever met, the uh, Moose Mulligan from Hunt Oil Company in Salvation, Peru. All right, let us get inside the mind of a planet eater. <clears throat> Take it away. The son of a Louisiana oil man, Moose Mulligan was born 57 years ago and grew up in the oil-rich bayou country around Lafayette where he learned the ropes of the oil biz and developed a lifelong love of the outdoors. This fortuitous combination combined with a brilliant mind, a restless spirit, and an unquenchable thirst for adventure has catapulted this Kipling quoting Renaissance man through a lifetime of adventures that could no doubt fill three novels. I admit it, I was jealous of the glob, glob the globe-trotting raconteur after knowing him for 15 minutes, speaking for millions of middle-aged men who wonder if they have lived their life to the fullest. I asked Moose what was his great secret of success. First of all, to do this job, you gotta love the land. I love the jungle. There's something about the way the light filters down through the trees, he said almost wistfully, harking back to the days he spent years ago as a seismic crew chief in the Sumatran rainforest. <clears throat> This is real Indiana Jones kind of stuff, he said. We'll be exploring where few folks have ever been before. Moose insists with a straight face that he is and has always been an environmentalist. It's just that the term environmentalist has gotten way too extreme for him over the years, leaving the more mainstream guys such as himself over in right field because the increasingly militant and meddlesome tree huggers have moved more and more to the left. To this day, he proudly and with no trace of irony wears his t-shirt with a giant green frog on the back above the slogan, Be Green! Celebrate Earth Day in three-inch high letters. On the front of the very same shirt is a tiny silhouette of an elk and the small print words, West Elk Mine Mountain Coal Company, LLC, where his son now works as an engineer in southwest Colorado. Speaking of environmentalist complaints against the mine, he rolls his eyes and says, I guess sulfur is one of those pollutants. I actually kind of like the way it smells. He sniffs the air and smiles, a carbon copy of Robert Duvall's I love the smell of napalm in the morning character from Apocalypse Now, and I can't help but laugh. There was a time back in the late 60s when Moose, like so many others of his generation, was a long-haired, flower-powered, desiderata spouting, he still loves that poem, fuck the establishment kind of guy. When he was an idealist college student at the Liberal University of Texas in Austin, he was active in local democratic politics and hobnobbed quote, with the Ann Richards gang. Some of his most cherished memories, not to mention some of his funniest stories, are about getting fucked up on mushrooms and bullshitting his way backstage at one of the early Willie Nelson Fourth of July picnics with some floozy from Houston. Another story for another book. But 
After the mushrooms and the music began to wear off along the way during the 1970s, he began to see the Planet Eater's light. First, he became a homeowner in Northwest Austin at an age when most of his buddies were getting their first apartments. He started to get more in involved with the oil business, which had always been good to his family. He soon became disenchanted with the whole Nattering and Richards gang and found himself over the years moving more and more in the direction of Anne's arch nemesis, George Bush, whose politics Moose strongly endorses, it goes without saying. <clears throat> when I was a young man, I had a narrow waist and a broad mind, he likes to joke. Now that I'm older, I have a broad waist and a narrow mind. I've worked through my meek phase I'm pissed off now. Somewhere between his meek phase and his pissed off phase, Moose developed a lifelong love of dynamite and explosives. Surprisingly, this did not happen in Vietnam, where he never served, though he says he would have if he had been called into service. Maybe that experience would have helped him work through his dynamite phase, where he's been stuck for more than 30 years. <clears throat> I first became aware that Moose's affinity for things that go boom in the jungle was more than just a job requirement it is, as he and I took advantage of a rare Sunday at, sunny afternoon in Salvacion to walk to the bird-filled little lake Machuwasi, the town's only tourist attraction, and about a half mile from Hunt's proposed base camp in Maine heliport. It's great to be back in the jungle again, Moose said as we left the filthy streets and logged out cow pastures behind us to enter the cool shade of the quiet forest. I do love waking up in the morning in the jungle in the fly camps. Fly camps meaning flying in by helicopter. He mused as we stood gazing over the bucolic scene below us from the mirror door. We decided to take a stroll down the hill to the lake. Spying a tiny piece of litter on the ground, he growled, I hate people who throw their trash on the ground. It's why they call them litter bugs. But then, spying a brand new Silencio sign put there in the path to ask tourists to be quiet so they wouldn't scare off the park's skittish bird population, Moose cracked. Shut up, Samuel. You may disturb an ant. As pleasant and cool as the thick forest had first seemed, it wasn't long before we were both soaked with sweat on the muggy afternoon. You know, if we just had a stick of dynamite right about now, we were 100 yards or so past the Silencio sign, here's what we do. You see this low spot through here, he said, indicating a shallow depression in the trail? We drop a stick of dynamite right about here, and we'd have us a nice refreshing swimming pool in about two minutes. Moose should know he is, after all, Hunt Oil's environment, health, and safety liaison man on the ground in the Mother of God. Of course, Moose won't have to use dynamite to scare off the birds from Machu Wasi as Hunt's helicopters, oops, make that South American Explorations helicopters will be doing a fine job of that on their own. Moose's best estimate is that the two choppers each will be taking off and landing ten times a day as they ferry supplies back and forth to the, to the guys running the seismic lines in the heart of the reserve, which means there should be about 40 chopper flights and possibly many more per day. 
I can see the badass Emilio, the caretaker at the park, flapping his hands in imitation of the terrified birds fleeing for their lives in the wake of the noise. Not to mention the McCalls at Mandu Learning Center's Clay Lick or the eco-tourist in the area who keeps several riverside lodges financially afloat. As hard as this is for me, I'm going to cut Moose some slack here about the whole mess over the base camp. When Hunt and Moose learned about Machu Wasi, they really did, I believe, try to move the base camp and its two chopper heliport about two miles further away in an effort to reduce conflicts with the park and the birds who live there and tourists who paid a visit there. Judging by his comments about disturbing the ants, I am sure this was not an easy idea for Moose to get behind, but hey, he did, and I do give him credit for being so compromising. There was just one little hitch. <clears throat> when Hunt tried to move the heliport, to a spot that was clearly less environmentally threatening to the local ecology, either base camp would have been built on logged out cattle ranches that hold virtually no ecological value anyway, so even a tree hugger like me has to admit that the only consideration was the threat to Machi Wasi they were not allowed to do so because the Peruvian government had already approved the laughable environmental impact analysis of the original site. If Hunt tried to move the camp to a less environmentally sensitive site, they would have had to do another assessment of that site, blah, 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 so they said, screw it, we'll keep it where we originally had it. I would have done the same thing. Of course, Moose uses this as just one more instance of the blame game that planet eaters are so fond of playing to blame everyone else but themselves for the problems that they are causing. We really wanted to move the base camp, he groused, and I believe him, but the environmental impact analysis had already been approved, so we're back to less than a kilometer from the lake. Now we're going to have to monitor for helicopter noise. I'm not sure how we're supposed to be able to do that. Oh well, they're just now beginning to develop that site, meaning the lake, for ecotourism, we, meaning the seismic crew, will be in and out of there in three or four months before they're even finished. That may or may not be true for the seismic crew, I thought, but it sure as hell won't be the case when Hunt comes back in a few years for the real assault against the Maracari. <clears throat> Moose took this blame game to such an extent that he started sounding like a whiny little kindergartner. Here's how the game, a favorite of Planet Eaters, works. For example, Moose would mention the subject of the gold miners in Amarakari, many, many of whom are natives who live in the reserve who for years have been raping and pillaging and poisoning their own community with virtually zero backlash from the Peruvian government and the tree huggers that he despises so much. Go pick on them, he whines, his argument being that if they can get away with such blatant disrespect for the environment, then nobody should be concerned about his innocuous little seismic job. It's kind of like saying, according to Moose, armed robbers are holding people up every day with guns. Why shouldn't I be allowed to be a purse snatcher? At one point, Moose said he had heard no reports of any problems with Hunt Oil's environmental boondoggle at Camasea, the huge natural gas project that Hunt spearheaded a few years ago and is still working hard to expand. When I barely mentioned 
that I had, in fact, heard some negative press about the planet-eating scene of destruction barely 100 miles from Americari, suddenly the Hunt Oil Project became a mishmash of different companies and government entities, and poor little picked on Hunt suddenly became a 12% owner in the pipeline. Another time I mentioned a 60 Minutes segment on problems with oil companies in the Ecuadorian Amazon, which I still have never seen. Moose said that he, yeah right, had never seen the program either. Even though neither one of us had ever seen the story, and as, I, as far as I know, Hunt Oil at least has nothing to do with that particular case, you should have heard the guy blaming everybody in the world, namely the government of Ecuador. <clears throat> you know, of course, who's in the hands of the oil companies, for the problem there. The next morning, he presented me with Chevron Oil's response to the story that he had never seen to convince me that the poor little innocent oil companies were being picked on by those damn irresponsible lefty journalists at CBS News. I had, I had almost let Moose's comment about the nice little swimming pool we could have built with one stick of well-placed dynamite, and I have no doubt he would be the man to place it, slide on by like 99% of everything else, he said, until he once again brought up the subject of creative uses for seismic testing explosives explosives that have nothing to do with seismic testing. Moose and I had found ourselves, as we found ourselves every night, trying to scare up a decent meal in Salvacion, Peru. We were at a place called Tammy's Restaurant, run by this sweetheart of a couple, Ruth and Pablo. After a hard day at the computer, Moose was ready for some ceviche to go along with his pisco sour. Only problem was the fish catch had been less than remarkable in Salvacia in the past few days, so there were no fish with which to make this Peruvian sushi, essentially raw fish cooked in lime juice and spices. Moose was in no mood to hear this. <clears throat> you know, Samuel, if it wasn't for all these damn eco-lodge owners around here, we could take what, what we call a DuPont lure, otherwise known as dynamite, <clears throat> what we call a DuPont lure down to the river, and we would have all the ceviche we could eat said the environment, health, and safety liaison between Hunt Oil Company and a crew of guys with a bunch of dynamite. I remember doing that in Sumatra. <clears throat> of course, we had to eat a bunch of tiny little fish, but hey, they were good eating. He pantomimed trying to eat a pile of sardine-sized fish, which is what you get when you, when you use something so indiscriminate as dynamite to go fishing. I have to admit guiltily that I laughed. The guy really is hilarious, but he could turn a planet-eating tale about dynamiting baby fish out of a river into a funny story. Encouraged by my reaction and fueled by a couple of stiff drinks, the natural comedian tried his routine out in his halting Spanish on Ruth and Pablo. Ruth shot her husband. Uh, did that gringo just say what I think he said? Look out of the corner of her eye. Pablo stared incredulous, incredulously at the laughing petrolero and and said, and this is a rough but close translation, dude, it's just not cool to dynamite fish out of a river. You'll kill all the baby fish. Suddenly the whole lighthearted energy in the room darkened, and I shot Moose this conspiratorial 
shut the fuck up, time out look, which he wisely seemed to understand. Fortunately, we recovered the mood and the evening passed without us getting kicked out of the place. Damn, dude, you sure know how to win friends and influence people, I said as we walked home. Cut the dynamite shit around here, for Christ's sake. Here I was, a tree hugger giving a planet eater lessons in diplomacy in the Peruvian Amazon before he got us both tarred and feathered. He agreed that I probably had a good point and that he would try to be more diplomatic with his politically incorrect sense of humor in the future. I don't know if it was that episode, the alcohol we shared, or just the familiarity that grows between travelers in a faraway land who have nothing more in common than a mother tongue that made Moose open up to me as the days passed. I had always felt that much of Moose's shuck and jive routine towards me was part of a well-rehearsed attempt to hold out on me as my own good old boy banner was my way of hiding my agenda from him. However, as our unlikely friendship grew, he began to drop his guard, which was exactly what I wanted him to do. As he grew more comfortable with me, his opinions about the scourge of the earth, those goddamned meddlesome tree huggers, <clears throat> grew more and more virulent. He cursed the damn tree huggers for being so emotional and passionate in their arguments against the planet eaters. While in doing so, he became one of the most emotional, passionate folks I had ever met in his foaming at the mouth virulence against people exactly like me. As smart as the guy was, he clearly had no clue who he was talking to as he railed against his nemesis. I wish I had a tape recorder, guys. This is just a tiny sample of what I endured, choking down my hydrant of ham-boned psychic puke all the while during several of the strangest days of my life. When I suggested that perhaps he might surprise himself if he actually would take the time to start a dialogue with those environmentalists he loves to hate so much, he replied, I would love to talk to a tree hugger, but they won't let go of the damn tree long enough to sit down and talk to me, he complained to a tree hugger who had been sitting down with him and talking for hours on end for several days straight. As he railed on and on about the emotionalism and the passion of the damn tree huggers, I dropped my own guard and made this serious mistake of suggesting that the tree huggers' arguments were coming from the moral high ground, as they are. You can imagine the reaction that got from Moose, the roll of the eyes and the pained expression. Don't these tree huggers have anything better to do with their lives? He groused. Don't talk to me about the moral high ground, Samuel. Bring me specific complaints about problems with one of my projects backed up by good science, and I'll talk to you. And of course, translated otherwise, shut the fuck up. In his newest job, he was particularly irritated by the whine of the eco-lodge operators in the area, especially some thorn in his paw by the name of Joaquin Rivers, who he obviously considered a minor mosquito for Hunt Oil to slap. He recalled visiting the campus of some school where they taught classes in tourism and recreation, which he lumps under the general heading of fluffology. I asked this one woman there, do y'all ever take any classes in this school? His abject contempt 
for fluffologist boiled over. I'm what you call a primary producer in this society. When I'm in Colorado, I'm putting food, otherwise known as beef, raised on public lands, directly on people's plates, okay? When I come to places like Peru, I'm looking for oil. At one point in his diatribes, he was accusing those damn tree huggers of getting in the way of alternatives to big oil, such as wind power. He wasn't sure of the details, and neither am I, but he had heard some crazy story about some kind of prairie chicken getting in the way of a wind farm that had somehow pitted the prairie chicken lovers against the wind farm supporters. <clears throat> Sometimes we might just have to let an endangered species go extinct, he said, obviously siding with the wind farm supporters. I'm looking out for a species called man. Over and over again, he would refer to those folks such as Barack Obama, a major target of his wrath, who, quote, want to take us back to the Stone Age in our energy policy. Even his own brother, also the son of an oil man, was one of those greenies looking for biofuel alternatives to gasoline. The poor guy was obviously getting ganged up on. I'm not going to deny it, guys. One of the main things that cemented our weird friendship that week was alcohol. Moose Mulligan, after 5 p.m., was a hard drinking man, and after a certain point, the alcohol would pretty much obliterate whatever was left of his edit button, and mine too, no doubt, as he pulled out all the stops in his diatribes against the damn tree huggers. No doubt, due to my own alcohol impaired judgment, I mentioned the name to Edward Abbey, Edward Abbey to Moose and ask him if he were familiar with that genius's work. Even though Moose admitted he had never read one single word that Edward Abbey had ever written about anything, that was no reason that he shouldn't have an opinion about the man. I am capable of murder, Moose let me know. Edward Abbey is someone I could take out with extreme prejudice. I laughed and said he was about 10 years too late in that desire that Abby was already dead. Good, then I'd get to shoot him twice. Talking about Abby's undercover stint as an employee at Canyonlands National Park in Utah, where Moose has had years of experience fighting the tree huggers upset about the oil company's desire to mine oil shale, Moose growled that it is scum like Edward Abbey that infiltrate folks like the Bureau of Land Management to dig up some tiny little detail to drive a wedge into plans of folks like the oil companies that disgust him more than any other. People like that think their ends justify any means, he said. Can you say ancient Indian Inca ruins, I quipped under my breath. Despite his outright hatred for tree huggers, there were a few folks even lower down his list than them. <clears throat> Besides those damn lefty journalists who always have an agenda, even worse than the land-based tree huggers were the damn whale watchers, Moose's pet name for marine biologist. 
A former offshore seismic man, the poor planet eater had to endure the presence of those pesky whale watchers who had the audacity to suggest that underwater explosive testing may may have a negative impact on marine mammals, particularly dolphins and whales, who depend on sonar to navigate their way through the open seas. One of the worst months Moose ever spent in 38 years in the oil business was being trapped on a ship with one of these wishy-washy whale washers who, was, who ascribed to the perfectly reasonable and logical precautionary principle. If there is any doubt as to whether an activity damages a species, the best course of action is to, duh, not engage in the questionable activity until conclusive scientific proof is in that the activity is, in fact, benign. What Moose would call good science that he is always carping about I had no doubt that underwater seismic testing explosions did not pose any problems. If I had a doubt, I wouldn't do it. He says it took a month, but he insists that when the whale watcher finished his month-long tour, he too was convinced that the test posed no risk to whales. I would like to talk to that whale watcher to get his side of the story on that opinion. Thank God for hydrocarbons! They saved the whale! Moose crowed to a whale watcher that showed up at our table at Ruth and Pablo's for margaritas one night, referring to the fact that sperm whales were saved by the oil companies when people s switched from whale oil to cheaper petroleum to light their lamps in the 19th century. I guess he had a tougher time convincing another whale watcher that underwater seismic testing was not a problem for dolphins. <clears throat> that just meant we had to do our underwater seismic testing at 4 a.m., he recalled laughing. Noticing I wasn't laughing along with him, he backtracked. Oops, I guess that isn't funny. Kind of like dynamiting fish out of the river, huh? <clears throat> there have been a few bright moments in his career as an offshore t seismic tester facing off against those pesky whale watchers over the years. I loved it when the French blew up the rainbow, the rainbow warrior. You gotta love those French. And remember, the Rainbow Warrior was the Greenpeace shrimp ship that the environmental organization used to defend whales. Another breed the oil and cattle man would just as soon do without are those pesky archaeologists. I stumbled upon this thorn in his paw during a conversation, one of many, we were having about the cursed gold miners in the Rio Colorado River. You know, a lot of people think the gold in the Rio Colorado isn't natural, he said, letting slip the fact that he knew, or at least suspected, that there were archaeological sites in the headwaters of the Rio Colorado, which is exactly where the Inca ruins in Amaracari are located, in fact. Wouldn't it be funny if it was an oil company that found that famous lost city of gold, he mused? Explorers have been searching for centuries for the fabled El Dorado, which legend has set somewhere in the jungles east of Cusco. He caught himself, thought about the fallout from that, and backtracked. Nah, We'd have the damn archaeologists all over our asses. One of the few times Moose dropped his shuck and jive routine with me that week was when I showed him the map I had that clearly showed the ruins he had alluded to right there in the middle of Hunt's network of seismic lines. Where did you get that map, he snapped, losing his cool. 
Maps showing archaeological sites are only supposed to be released to authorized personnel, which clearly did not include me. The, clan, the man clearly does not want that information about these ruins getting out, which is why I am doing everything I can to get the information out. Similar to his story about being stuck on a ship with a whale watcher, Moose told me about a miserable trip he and his seismic crew, good old boys, had to endure with a nagging young archaeologist in Utah. We were sitting out there, you know, on BLM land, having a barbecue, a few beers, really enjoying ourselves, you know. This guy was really starting to piss us off. He wasn't one of the boys, if you know what I mean. I finally had enough and called the home office and said, you got to get this dude out of here. I didn't even mention his uh, effeminate nature. The home off, back to me, the home office did in fact pull the guy off the job and replaced him with a female archaeologist that Moose and the boys could at least tolerate hanging around their barbecues. The newest group that Moose is learning to despise, besides that bunch of whiny get-a-life eco-lodge owners and tour operators, are those greedy, damn money-hungry money -hungry Indians in Amarakari, the ones clear-cutting the jungle and dumping mercury into the rivers while whining about Moose's innocuous little seismic lines and helicopters. He is particularly outraged over the village of Shintoya's demands that Hunt Oil cough up a whopping $22,000 for permission to bring one of their lines across their village's land, which, as Moose and I will both tell you, has already been laid to waste by the natives themselves living there. The Indians don't care anything about their land. They only care about the money, grouse the oil and cattle man, who clearly suffers no noble savage fantasies. I sheepishly must admit that I agree with much of the Planet Eater's sentiments here, though I would soften that statement just a wee bit and say that the natives care, care more about the money than they do their land. Back to Moose. If you are concerned about the environment, work with us. Due largely to the fact that Moose managed to hold out on me that Hunt had scheduled a meeting with the Shintoya natives, I knew the day, I just didn't realize that the meeting was scheduled at the perfectly reasonable hour of 6.30 a.m. I can't give you a first-hand report of what happened at that meeting. I caught up with Moose just as the meeting was breaking up. Although he first tried to pretend that he was confident that we'll be able to work something out. His temper got the best of him, and he reminded me that Hunt Oil had already been awarded the contract by the Peruvian government and the oil company, not the Indians, therefore had the power of law behind them. Once again, the poor picked upon planet eaters were trying to be nice guys, and once again, they were running up against opposition who had no legal right to complain. This was a refrain I had heard dozens of times in the short time I had known him. There were close to 100 people in that room, and only 10 to 20 of them were the naysayers. But it's always the naysayers with the biggest mouth. Moose fumed outside the meeting hall. That's not showing much respect for those folks who do want us here. We're trying to be good neighbors, but if they want us in Shatua, in Shatua, we have, if they don't want us, you know, in Shintoya, we have plenty of other places to start work. Remember, 
we have the subsurface rights, which always trump the surface rights. If the natives are unwilling to work with Hunt, we'll turn it over to the government to, you know, to enforce the contract. We'll leave it up to the jefes, the chiefs and the villages and the government lawyers, and let God sort it all out. The meek shall inherit the earth, but not the mineral rights. Can you say bagua? While the natives are deciding whether or not they want to share Hunt's largesse by going to work for the corporation, and you can bet plenty of them will, regardless of what the official line from the village chief is, Moose is moving ahead with hiring guys who are ready to get to work hacking trails through the jungle. I met one of his newest hires, a nice young fellow from Puerto Maldonado named Manuel, who quit his low-paying job at a wildlife rescue center in the city to go make the big bucks, which I think is a little less than 20 bucks per day, though I could be being way too generous to hunt here. <clears throat> he left his job to go work for Hunt in the jungle. I met this young man, and it was obvious to me that he was a borderline tree hugger. I was almost as much surprised by the fact that Moose hired on this bad fit as much I was by the fact that Manuel was willing to go to work for Moose. That would be as crazy as yours truly, being a fucking real estate agent or working for the world's biggest drug testing company. Not surprisingly, the two were off to a bad start before Manuel had even signed the contract. He's a nice kid, but I can already tell he's going to be a problem, Moose whined to me over the two 55-gallon drums of cerveza. He could turn into a real communist. I can just see him trying to form a damn union with the other guys. He was trying to tell me about raising beef that you don't need to destroy all those acres for cows when you can raise chickens instead. I guess he's worried about rainforest deforestation. I told him, why eat chicken? Why don't you just eat vegetables instead? The poor picked upon planet eater took a long swig of cold beer and summed up his frustration with his tree-hugging seismic crew. Don't worry about life. Life will take care of itself. With all the bullshit the poor planet eater had to deal with in his life as a globe-trotting oil man, you would think he would like to take a rest from it all when he gets back home to his 600-acre ranch in southwest Colorado, which he has called home since 1995. <clears throat> no chance. As soon as he gets back home, he's right back at it again with all those namby-pamby environmentalists who are opposed to his God-given and federally sanctioned right to graze his private cows on public forest land because the tree huggers trip over a cow patty when they're out taking a walk in the woods. Moose pays $2 per cow per month to graze his 600 cows on 20,000 acres of public land for two months in the summer. $2,400 per year out of his profits, and he doesn't want to listen to those little naysayers in Colorado any more than he wants to listen to them in Shintuya, Peru. To educate, a, to educate me about the problems he faces, Moose printed out an article from the Fair and Balanced Fox News Service titled Range War in the West. Unfortunately, the author's name wasn't attached, so I can't give him credit for this fine piece of Fair and Balanced News reporting. <clears throat> Quoting the Fox News article, well, referring to the environmentalist 
battling grazing on public lands <clears throat> must want something? Not really, except to drive the ranchers out of business and let the land return to its pristine state when there were no cattle. I have some news for, you know, the environmentalist. Before the cattle even came to the West, huge herds of elk and buffalo roamed the plains and valleys for centuries, and I'll bet they ate a little grass and tramped through the streams. You know, quoting the Fox article, hmm, sounds like a damned good excuse to get rid of cattle and start raising elk and bison to eat, to me. Tree huggers tripping over cow pies aren't his only nemesis in Colorado. There's also those pain in the ass little devils that chew his irrigation lines and trip up his cows, the dreaded prairie dogs. I've been trying to make them go extinct on my ranch for years, but I'm only 50% of the way there, he complained to me. They're just so fun to shoot. They sit there like little targets. Since bullets are too slow, and I guess dynamite would make a bigger hole than the prairie dogs make to trip up his cows, Moose has, Moose has taken to chemical warfare in his battle against the pint-sized buck-toothed terrorist, not wanting to pay the high price of the officially sanctioned prairie dog poison. He has come up with an ingenious alternative where he soaks horse shit. Not the fresh road apples. You really gotta compact the shit in your hands. In gasoline, then plugs the holes so the toxic fumes gas the little ground squirrels deep inside their burrows. I sat there listening to him complain about how tough his life is on the range, trying to imagine this brilliant, college-educated Marlboro man stalking around his ranch with a bag of road apples in one hand, a can of gasoline in the other. I could just imagine the crazed grin on his face when he encountered a prairie dog burrow and could see him packing the shit in the palm of his hand, soaking it in gasoline, stuffing it in the hole, and saying, Take that, you little fucker! I know how he feels. I was exactly the same way when I used to gas gophers that used to mess up my lawn in California. <clears throat> Dude, it sounds like you have way too much spare time on your hands on your ranch, I told him. Before anyone out there gets the idea that Moose and I had no common ground to meet on, there was one area where he and I were in complete agreement. Neither of us have any patience with folks who complain about all those big bad planet eaters and their evil ways when they are making no lifestyle changes in their own lives to change things. Until you're ready to back up the whiny tree-hugging rhetoric with some fucking personal responsibility, a concept Moose firmly defends, all your bitching and moaning is nothing more than the whining of a bunch of two-faced hypocrites. Do you like hot water in your shower? Well, there's one. Gas well, Moose said. Do you like to use soap in your shower? Well, there's another well. I'm not sure what kind of soap Moose uses, perhaps gasoline, but I see his point. As Moose was always mining me for information on the enigmatic Joaquin Rivers, I slipped up in a weak moment and repeated the Manu Airport rumor. Needless to say, this was a great source of humor to him. I made sure.